بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم وصلى الله على سيدنا محمد أشرف الأنبياء والمرسلين uh, The Prophet peace be upon him when he went out to his house he used to he had a prayer he said Allahumma inni a'udhu bika na'dhalla aw udhal Oh God I seek refuge in you that I should go astray or be led astray adhalla aw udhal aw azilla aw uzal or that I should trip or that I should be tripped or that I should oppress or that I should be oppressed or that I should show ignorance or I should be the victim of somebody else's ignorance so that was a prayer that he made uh, when he began his day today uh, this lecture inshallah is going to be on the topic of Islam and Oh, no, I wasn't reading that. Yeah, that was from the... No, this is a passage I'm going to look at. But I could write it out for you if you want. The, um, to begin, I, I'm not going to talk today about the Shahada because that's going to be in the section on Iman. So I'm going to really more focus on the, the four pillars after that and then look at the Sharia. So I would begin by saying the best way to understand a tradition in my estimation is what they call through the normative uh, practice in comparative religions. Uh, I studied that my uh, undergraduate work was in comparative religion and I noticed that teachers tended to take two routes, one of two routes. They would either use the class as a way of, of analyzing a teaching, allowing the teaching to speak for itself, or they would use the class uh, well, there are probably more than two, but the basic two, where they would use the class to uh, kind of s to superimpose their prejudices on the tradition and really tell what they thought about the religion instead of allowing the tradition to speak for itself. And one of the best ways to do that, and it will seem like they're being objective, but it's actually quite... Uh, and I don't know if there's malintent and I'm not going to get into that but one of the best ways of doing that is to look at a religion from what they term a descriptive approach which is where instead of looking at what the religion says you look at what practice uh, the people who practice it do and then you can just explore a lot of problematic aspects of any teaching you can say if you, if you, don't, if you have a, a bone of contention with Catholicism you'll really emphasize in your course on the Inquisition and how horrific the, uh, the Catholics were. Um, uh -huh. That's true, but the problem is that uh, to the non-believer one looks and sees that which is being practiced or being practiced upon. Um, you can say that all religions, you know, uh, preach uh, humility and, and love thy neighbor um, and all of the things that we would consider as, as uh, positive uh, but but uh, if uh, you are being uh, harassed or being told what to do be in the name of God, you know, you tend to focus on that. How does one get out from that? Uh, well, yeah, and, and these are good points, and this is why people will often uh, focus on that. And we live particularly in an age when uh, secularism be has become quite dominant, and the religious worldview, certainly in the West, has taken a back seat. But my, my point of bringing that out is, is that, I would prefer that anyone who, who looked at a tradition, and this is my practice with, with any uh, religious tradition, is to look first and foremost at how the tradition itself is articulating itself, how the tradition is describing itself, irrespective of how it's been practiced in the past by people, whether it's Christianity, Judaism, Islam, Hinduism, or Buddhism, and then to move into a descriptive uh, examination of the teaching of how has this teaching impacted human cultures. So I think both views are valid, but when there is an emphasis on, on one as opposed to the other, I think that's going to lead to some very serious misconceptions with any tradition. Uh, and that on top of biases that people might have, so they'll examine certain areas uh, 
with, to the exclusion of other areas. So what I would like to do is look at a few verses in the Quran dealing with the idea of Islam, the word itself, in the Quran. And the first one is in the third uh, surah chapter, it'll say S3, it's on page 165 of your blue uh, text. S3, which means Surah 3, and then at the bottom it's uh, the Ayah or the verse 83, page 165. It says, Allahi yabagun. Do they seek other than the Deen of God? That's what it says. So I want to look first at two words here. Sometimes you'll see it uh, written like this. Deen in the Arabic language is related to debt. Which, is, if, you know, it's interesting that guilt in German is, is the origin of guilt is also debt. And there's an argument that a lot of religion is based on a sense of indebtedness or guilt uh, towards uh, God. The word deen is related to debt and the idea with the word deen because Islam is called in Arabic Deenul Islam, the deen of Islam. Literally you could translate it as the debt of Islam, the debt of submission. In other words, the idea is, is that we have been endowed or given blessings by the Creator and the debt that we owe is submission to the Creator. So the Deen, now if you look, the word has many uh, meanings and it comes from a root word da ya na da ya na One of the meanings is to discipline something. There's a tradition where the Prophet said man dan an whoever disciplines his soul so Deen is related to disciplining the soul. Another uh, meaning is the Day of Judgment, Yawm al the In the first uh, chapter of the Quran it says the Day of Judgment. The word used for the, the Day of Judgment is Yawm al The day the debts fall due. The day the debts fall due. The day of reckoning. The day of Hisab. Another meaning is a rain that returns again and again and brings the earth back to life. That's another meaning in the Arabic language. So Deen, from, you know, you, can, you get a semantic field and you start getting a feel for the word what it means. There is an idea definitely in the Quran, there is a concept that Deen has, there has been an unbroken chain of Deen since the beginning of the Adamic experience on earth. Bless you. An unbroken chain since the beginning. There's an idea that there has been prophetic dispensations to human beings since time began, or at least since the experience of time for the human being. Now, the verse says, do they seek other than the Deen? of Allah, while all creatures in the heavens and the earth have willingly or unwillingly bowed to His submission. Now in the Arabic it says, وَلَهُ أَسْلَمَ مَنْ فِي السَّمَاوَاتِ وَالْأَرْضِ طَوْعًا وَكَرْهًا so what it's saying there in the Arabic is, do they seek other than this deen when in reality everyone is in a state of submission, willingly or unwillingly, and to him is their return. So the first meaning of Islam that we're getting in the Quran is all of creation. Is in submission. That's the first meaning. Because the, the, me, the word Islam means submission. It means, Aslama means to submit. Now if we break down the word, so this is the first meaning that you will find in the Quran. 
that the idea that everything in reality is in submission to God. Willingly or unwillingly, we are all in submission. Now there are acts, there are areas of submission that the human being recognizes. One of them is the call to nature. Right? We have to do certain things that we cannot avoid. One of them is to eat. That is part of our nature. We get hungry, we must eat or we die. We have to relieve ourselves once we've eaten or, or taken drink. We have to sleep, right? Byron called sleep the gentle tyrant. It oppresses us, but we, it's not an oppression that we, we, we mind. But sleep comes upon us and we can't fight it eventually. Few days, maybe. Go too long and, and you go into acute psychosis. So the idea is that there are aspects, and then we have submission in our being. There are limitations to the physical body. We have limitations. We can only eat so much. We can only uh, do so much physically before we're exhausted. We have limitations in our movement, given the, the, the structure of our bodies. So there is a type of a submission of the self, given that we are temporal creatures, limited to physical uh, and, and, and uh, limited by physical uh, aspects of our nature. So in the Quran there is an idea that everything is in submission and then there is a reminder that we will be returned. That, that if you look at creation, things are emerging and then returning into non-existence. Everything that has life comes into existence and then returns to non-existence. The plant, the, the, the vegetable uh, kingdom, the animal kingdom, and ultimately the mineral kingdom. All of this is going into non-existence after it had come into existence. Now the next uh, verse I'd like to look at is 2, 133. 2, 133. It's page 53. F page 53 in the blue book. Surah 2, verse 133. The verse says, Were you witnesses when death came to Jacob, Yaqub? Behold, he said to his sons, What will you worship after me? They said, We shall worship your God and the God of your fathers, of Abraham, Ishmael, Ishaq, or Isaac, the one true God to whom we submit. Now in the Arabic it says, وَنَحْنُ لَهُ مُسْلِمُونَ So here is an idea that the previous tradition, because remember this, this, this is the Qur'an coming, the Prophet Muhammad is teaching this Qur'an. And there's an idea certainly in, 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 in most people's minds that Islam is the religion of Muhammad. Right? This is the idea that most people have. What, what's being emphasized here is something else. This is the religion also of Isaac, of Abraham. Because they're saying, we are submitting to your God and the God of those who went before you, and we are Muslims. So the second definition is Islam as guidance from prophets. Islam as guidance from prophets, irrespective of one individual prophet like the prophet Muhammad or Jesus or Moses or Buddha if he was, uh, Krishna. I don't know. I mean there's, there's prophets we don't know about. The Quran says some of them we've told you their stories and others we have not. But there is definitely an idea in the Qur'an that Islam is the teaching of all of these prophets. Now the third aspect 
is Islam as the religion of the Prophet Muhammad. So, the Quran is telling us that every creature is in submission to God. The Quran is telling us that previous prophets were teaching Islam as a, a, a religion. And then the idea that this is the religion because there is a verse in the Quran that says Al-Yawm Akmaltu Rakum Deenukum Today I have perfected your deen Wa Raditu Rakum Islam Adina And I am content as Islam as your religion That was on uh, the, the, the final Hajj, the pilgrimage of the Prophet He said this in, in front of a multitude so this is that his, the final form of this Islam was perfected in the Prophet Muhammad. This is how the Muslims view Islam. Now you will meet many Muslims that might not have this idea because like many Christians, they've never studied their book. They've never really, you know, they're nominal Muslims. They were born Muslim. Uh, they might believe it because their fathers told them that this is true or because like uh, many people in this country, they have fond childhood memories of Christmas, things like that. So they relate to Christianity or their uh, Judaism, whatever. I mean, many people, this is really bottom line why they are what they are, because they were born into a certain environment. So if you were born in Sri Lanka, you might be Buddhist. If you were born in China, you might be a Taoist or a Confucianist. If you were born in uh, America, you could be uh, a myriad of, of, of uh, teachings following even now uh, paganism. I know a woman in uh, Santa Cruz who's raising her child as a, a pagan quite consciously. Um, they, has, they, do, uh, they have altars to different gods like the moon goddess and things in the house and that's how she's raising her child. right? And this will become more and more common as uh, as people begin to break off. You know, the homogeneity of previous uh, periods is really breaking down. Like uh, one of the poets said, the center is no longer holding, right? We're really seeing a, a breakdown uh, of what some of them would call the grand narrative of cultures. That probably is not true in the Muslim world to the extent it is in the West for a number of reasons. But uh, certainly here we're seeing that. So, now there is, there is a, f a fourth uh, aspect of Islam that I'm going to add here, which is death. Because the word in Arabic to die is aslama. Aslama nafsahu. He gave up the ghost. Right? And this is what we, we used to say. I, don't, I mean, I remember hearing that expression when I was younger. He gave up the ghost, right? The spirit. He died, right? And it's interesting. I had a course from, from an excellent professor on death and dying in religions, and he had this sheet of euphemisms about death that was about, you'd be amazed in, this, in our culture alone how many ways we can say somebody died. Right? Kick the bucket. That's all she wrote. <laughs> bit the dust <laughs> there's a lot of ways to say you know one of the Arab poets he said if you don't die by the sword you're going to die some other way there are lots of ways to die but death is one right? <laughs> so this idea here really, I think, goes back to, to the fact that there's a verse in the Quran, in, in the chapter called The Event, in which the Quran says, وَإِذَا بَلَغَتَ الْحُلْقُونَ When the ghost reaches the, the throat. وَأَنْتُمْ حِينَ إِذِنْ تَنْظُرُونَ And you're looking, you're watching this thing happen. Right? وَأَنْتُمْ حِينَ إِذِنْ تَنْظُرُونَ Then it says in the Quran, make it go back. Make it go back. If you're in control, make it go back. So the idea there is 
And then it says, and we are closer to him than you are, but you don't see. The idea is that when the ghost gets to that point, the self, the soul, there's nothing we can do. That is absolute submission, right? And we can try, and we're pretty good now at, at doing, uh, I mean, I've seen people, you know, I, I worked in a critical care for about four years and did, was in a lot of codes, you know, what they call codes. Um, and it's pretty amazing. You see somebody, they're dead. You come in, no pulse, no heart, no breathing, defibrillate do some CPR, defibrillate. I've seen people come back, start breathing, and it's pretty amazing, but how long can we do that for? Ultimately, that stopped, and even the success of that is quite small, unlike television. I think it, it works 90% of the time on television. It works about 8% in the hospital, <laughs> right? They had all these physicians complaining about that because if they coded the, their relatives, they'd say, well, why didn't it work? It always works on television, right? <laughs> Welcome to reality, folks. You know, things aren't aren't, aren't like what like television, unfortunately, or fortunately. <laughs> so the next thing here I want to uh, go to is uh, five eleven. I forgot to do that. Five eleven. Uh huh. A quick question on notation. We've got. Uh, 5A11. Um, or yeah, A, me, A means Aya. Aya. Oh, because, yeah, the, okay. I think Aya is a okay. better word than to say verse. Uh -huh. um, verse uh, relates to uh, the translation of the Bible, uh, King James Version, whereas the Aya literally means a sign in Arabic, a sign, which is a very interesting word. The idea of, of that we're dealing with a, a, a symbol. What is Sura? Sura means, uh, in the Arabic language, it relates to like a gate or a, uh, something around a city. And the idea is that a Sura is an, it's, it's, it's a series of signs or meanings that are, that they are, they're, they're contained within a limited uh, number. So, there you see Oh, I'm sorry, 5111. It's 5111. What's that? The J. Where's that? Okay, good. That's Juz, which is the sixth part. So there's 30 parts to the Quran. And Juz is Arabic for 1 30th of the Quran. Jews means a part. So the sixth part means this is one, this is the sixth, beginning with the first, one, two, three, four, yeah. And the last part would be the 30th. So there are 30 parts of the Quran, we're in the sixth part. Yeah. Yeah, page number is 325. So there it says on, on the top of the page, verse 111. And behold, I inspire to the disciples to have faith in me and my messenger. And they said, we have faith and, do, and to you bear witness that we bow to Allah as Muslims. Now the, the disciples there are the Hawariyin or the disciples of Jesus. So again, here's the idea. We had the idea that, that Isaac, who is the, the father of the Jewish tradition, we have the idea that Jesus, uh, the, the, the prophet or, or the savior of the Christian tradition, according to the Christians, that they're saying we're Muslims. So this is, I think, really important to, to see that from just to understand how the, the Muslims view the matter. They really do view the matter that Islam is an unbroken chain. It's not something new. And the prophet Muhammad did not see himself as bringing a new religion. He really saw himself as a renewer of a ancient tradition. All right. Now, once you've seen those, what we're obviously what we're attempting to do in this two-week period is understand Islam 
from the perspective of the religion of those who believe in the Prophet Muhammad and his tradition. Not so much, we're not here to study comparative religion, I'm not here to teach you about uh, your own traditions or anything like that. But I, just as a starting point, I think it's important to recognize that that is definitely part of the Muslim worldview. That Christianity it, it was an Islam, Judaism was an Islam, and there were many Islams that we don't know about and don't name. Uh, because the Quran does not mention them, it talks about other traditions simply and it does not mention them by name. But like uh, Dr. Shafia mentioned the other day, there is a tradition from the Prophet Muhammad that, that there have been 124,000 Prophets, uh, there have been 313 or 14 messengers, um, there have been uh, over a hundred books uh, that have come down uh, and all we're told about is four books and then the tablets of Abraham and Moses. So there are many things that we don't know about traditions. Uh, and this is why the Muslims traditionally have tended not to say we don't believe like, I mean, I, I, uh, I would say that Hinduism, even though for, from a Muslim point of view, there are many things in it that are very problematic. Still, I would hesitate to say that it wasn't a prophetic tradition personally because uh, it's a very ancient tradition and from a Muslim point of view uh, the previous traditions have been distorted. That is the Muslim worldview. So the next thing to understand is how is Islam identified in terms of believing in the Prophet Muhammad? How is Islam? How is a Muslim a Muslim not as somebody in submission to God but as somebody following the teaching of Islam as a word that describes a religion of about one-fifth of, of the world's population. The best thing to do again is go, go to the tradition. And in this book here, uh, the 40 Hadith, there is in the second Hadith, which is a very famous Hadith, it's a Hadith in which the Prophet, according to the tradition, is asked by Jibril or Gabriel, and they don't know it's Gabriel yet, and he asked them, it's the second hadith, page 28. He asks him, tell me about Islam. Akhbirni an al-Islam. And the Messenger of Allah, peace and blessing of Allah be upon him, said, Islam is to testify that there is no God but Allah and Muhammad is his messenger. So the first one is the, what's called shahada. The second, he says, uh, and that you perform prayers. So what's called salah. The third, zakat. The fourth, fasting. And the fifth, hajj. So this is how Islam is defined by the Prophet Muhammad in this hadith. And that therefore would be the best description in terms of a normative understanding of the tradition. The first one, again, I don't want to go into it, but I will briefly mention. The word shahada means witnessing. And it usually means witnessing with the eye. Ashhadu means I, I witnessed, I saw with my eye. It also means a testimony. In other words, a person can bear witness. And it's interesting because in Islam, you have to have eyewitnesses. Right? You can't have a testimony that's not an eyewitness. In any of the had punishment, you have to have somebody who saw the act, who saw the person stealing. Can't be, there's, there's not circumstantial evidence is really hard to hold up in uh, traditional Islamic courts. So the idea of shahada is something that a person sees for themselves, that there is no God but Allah. That is something from the Muslim point of view, it is something that they witness and see for themselves and that Muhammad is his messenger. It's something that they witness that they believe based on witnessing. Now obviously, many Muslims in the world, they, they're Muslim again because they heard this from their parents. Their parents told them, La ilaha illallah Muhammad Rasulullah, that's why they believe it. Which gets into circular reasoning. You know, why do you believe, or really regressive reasoning, why do you believe, you know, Islam is true, my father told me. Well, why did he believe it? His father told him. Well, why did he believe it? His father told him. Or why do you believe in uh, Islam? Because the Quran says it's true. Well, how do you know the Qur'an says is true? Well, because the Qur'an says it's true, right? This type of reasoning that really, in the end, is actually quite flimsy. 
And again, we get into this idea of unreflective, undifferentiated uh, people, people that have not given a lot of thought to their traditions. And the Muslims are as much a victim to that phenomenon as any other people, really. I, I think that, uh, and in many cases, it, it can be actually more exacerbated, you know, because the tradition in this culture, now with the breakdown, you know, we're in a kind of post-Christian period, uh, there's a breakdown and, and it has enabled people to look and examine their own traditions. There's a lot of uh, critical uh, awareness in this culture. Uh, in the Muslim world, there, there, there really isn't a critical examination of their beliefs. Why do we believe? You know, very, very few people will. And uh, I think it's actually very difficult in a lot of Muslim countries for, for people to do that. But I think a belief that's not rooted in self-examination is ultimately uh, very limiting. Uh, Abu Ala al-Ma'arri, who's kind of considered a heretic in the Muslim tradition, uh, that was one of his things about religion. He just felt religion was just something that uh, was, you know, was people just didn't reflect on it at all. Now, if we look then, I, I don't want to cover this, but I want to go to this, because I'm going to do this in detail on the section on Iman. If we look at prayer, salah, the word in Arabic is it's a word that comes from a root word that means it can mean a few things. One of them is to burn up. The idea that prayer burns up wrong actions. That is one of the meanings. Another root meaning is a connection, a sila. A connection with God. That prayer is a connection with God. Another uh, idea of the prayer is submission itself. That the prayer is a form of submission. Now the Quran, the idea in the Quran about prayer is that all peoples and all creatures have been given a prayer. If you look in 22.18 22, 18. Uh, it would be 954. It says, Have you not seen that all prostrate to Allah? All things that are in the heavens and the earth, the sun, the moon, the stars, the hills, the trees, the animals, and a great number among mankind. But a great number are also such as unto whom the chastisement is justly due. So here is an idea that everything is prostrating. Everything is in a state of prostration. The heavens, the earth, the mountains, the trees, that everything is worshipping. This is something in the Quran, it says, everything is glorifying God, but you do not hear its glorification. There is a tradition uh, that the Prophet Muhammad picked up some rocks, pebbles, in his hand, and he held them out. And some of his companions heard the rocks glorifying God. And then he... Uh, he put them away. But so the point is, is that that was an example in the Muslim tradition of the Prophet showing people that everything is in glorification. Now, if you notice, when it gets to man, it changes its, uh, the way it says. It says, and a great number from humankind. Now this is where the Quran introduces the idea of free will. Not everybody, unlike the rest of creation, not all of human beings, are in a state of awareness. So only, only a great number of people are even aware. Many people are in heedlessness of prayer itself. Or that they should be worshipping. So there's an idea in the Muslim tradition that we, as human beings, can either be conscious of our praising God or we're in a type of unconscious 
uh, state. And this goes back again to the idea everything is sub in submission willingly or unwillingly and also wittingly or unwittingly. From the Muslim perspective, the, the body is in a state of worship. The heart is in a state of worship. You know, the, the, the movement in and out of the heart in Arabic is called qabd and bast in Arabic. Qabd is contraction, uh, bast is expansion. And the, there are two names from the 99 names of God, al-qabd and al basit the contractor and the expander. So the lungs expanding, contracting. The pupils expanding, contracting. The heart expanding, contracting. The body is always moving in a state of expansion, contraction. And this again relates to the two dominant attributes where I'm going to talk much more about it when we deal with Iman, of majesty and beauty. Majesty is contraction, beauty is expansion. And these are the two dominant qualities or characteristics of creation that are literally displaying for the human being an awareness of God's presence in his creation. So the Muslim is the one who is supposed to, and I'm using Muslim in its ideal sense, in a normative sense, not you know the, the quote-unquote Muslim world. I really want to get out of that idea of, you know, it's, this is, I'm not talking about Algeria or uh, Afghanistan or Iran or I'm talking about the Quranic view of a Muslim not how people ex believe what they believe or their deluded states and things like that you know the, there's crazy people all over the world um, you know I, I spent a period of time in uh, working in a, a psych unit and uh, very interesting people really believe they're prophets of God <laughs> yeah. and, and you kind of you, you watch this guy and he's telling you he said, look, I've got a message from God. You know, and you say, uh-huh. And he says, and God says that this, this, and this. And you're in big trouble if you don't believe me. And there's a kind of, you know, I used to listen to these people because that was part of what we were supposed to do. Uh, I used to listen to these people and I, there was kind of, there was something in me that wanted to say, come on, you know, you're just pulling my leg, right? There was really something in me that just wanted to nudge this person. But after a while, you start realizing they're not pulling your leg. They really do believe this condition. And we have a phenomenal capacity for delusional states. And most of us, and I would include myself, are walking around with our own delusions. We're just simply unaware of them. And I would really recommend a book, if you're interested in this subject, by Gorman, the man who wrote uh, Emotional Intelligence. He has another book that is actually, I think, much better than the first one. The first one became popular, interestingly enough. They kind of, the second one is not as popular, but it's called um, Vital, uh, False Truths, Vital Lies, vital Simple Truths, Vital Lies, Simple Truths, The Psychology of Self-Deception. Very interesting book. Because here's somebody who's just looking at now what we know about our brain and, and our delusional states. And I think that religion is, is really one of the big opportunities to go into serious delusional states. Uh, Gorman? Goleman. Goleman. G-O-L-E-M-A-N. It was, and it only became, now it's, yeah, but it's, it's after his emotional intelligence. See, this is what the publishers do. You know, so a guy writes a book, nobody ever hears about it. Then he writes a bestseller, and suddenly all his old books are in print, right? <laughs> the market, uh, right? The logic of the market. So, you know, the, the point being is that when we're talking about Islam, I really don't want to look at this kind of other phenomenon, which is the phenomenon of delusional religious states that are in every tradition, right? There are people all over walking around believing that they have the truth and nobody else does. And the, a lot of those people are quite frightening, you know, especially when they become president of the United States and then you're in big trouble, right? <laughs> uh, he doesn't remember anymore, yeah. But when he was, it was kind of frightening. <laughs> So, let's see now. So the human being then is, is the individual that can either become conscious of the fact that 
everything is in praise and everything is in uh, glorification and everything is in prostration or they can be heedless of this fact. The idea then within the Muslim tradition is that Islam is the process of waking up to this reality. And the Prophet Muhammad said, peace be upon him, he said, human beings are asleep and when they die they wake up. So there is an idea that we are in a dreamlike state. And I find it really interesting that the word in Arabic for child, uh, which is ghulam, comes from ghulma, which means to lust after, to desire. That a child is a ghulam until they enter into what is called puberty. And the word in Arabic for puberty is ihtalam. The root word comes from a word which means to dream. Now when you take the root meaning of this ihtalam, it literally means to internalize the dream. If you take the word to reach adulthood, it means to internalize or become aware of the dream. The idea there, I think, is that children are in a dream world. It's a, it's a beautiful world that they're in. And, but they're not aware of the dreamlike nature of the world that they're in. And, and it's a gift. And, and actually from the Muslim point of view, children have no accountability. And the beginning of discernment is about the age of seven, where you begin to take them to account gently. Prior to that, traditionally the Muslims did not encourage any type of discipline for children before the age of seven. The discipline should be very gentle discipline. The idea is that they literally do not have within them the capacity to, uh, to restrain themselves from their actions. Now children, obviously you'll see, I mean, my ch child's five years old and he's getting a sense of right and wrong. But the idea there is that really that their brains, you can tell them don't do this. They'll do it again, oftentimes not because they're disobeying you, and that they might appear to be guilty when you remind them because suddenly they become aware. But there is a type of forgetfulness that takes place in the child's world because the brain cannot uh, maintain this continuity. And you'll see it, uh, Chilton Pierce talks about this phenomenon when the neural networking is taking place in those first seven years that a child at about the age of two and three, the will is developing. And it's a very important time and what he says one of the, the tragic aspects is that the will in children is broken at that age, right? That there is, there's a, the, the parent will literally uh, want to break the will because they see this child rebelling. They see this child saying, me and no. They learn no, right? It's the first word that children really get in contact with. Very interesting that they do a negation to negate, which is very important in, in the Islamic understanding because the first and primary task of the human being is to negate, to negate creation. And this is why the, the shahada itself begins with a negation, la ilaha, no God. That, that, that the human being must learn to negate before it can learn to affirm. And so the child first learns negation and then it learns affirmation. And it's interesting that a child, when its will is developing, one of the examples Pierce uses is a child will beeline for something and the, the parent or the adult will say, don't touch that. And the child will look at the parent and just keep going. And the parent will interpret that as gross disobedience. What Pierce says is the fact is that his will, the volition in his very primitive uh, uh, neurosystem the volition reached critical mass. And at that point, the adult says, don't touch that. And the child's, I can't help myself anymore. It can't stop, you see. And it goes and it does it. Now we can see that in our own lives as adults, right? There's a point when human beings reach a critical mass. You see, you see the chocolate and you say, you know, I really, I don't, no, go ahead, just try. Well, I really don't want, go ahead, just try. And then suddenly it's, it gets to critical mass and, and that's it. You know, they can't stop. So we, we see that in adults as well, but in children, it's, it's blameless. Whereas in adults, I think there's, you know, come on, you didn't have to eat it, right? <laughs> so, the first, the second pillar, which is prayer, is trying to connect people to God.
to put people into a state in which they are connected. Now, how is that done? It's done by obligating prayer. Prayer is not choice in Islam. There are prayers that you can do out of choice, but there are prayers that you have to submit to. So again, the idea of submission comes into the idea of praying. I submit to five prayers a day. That is something that I submit to. That's a rule. I'm being told pray five times a day and I can either say no, I don't want to pray or I'm going to pray. I recognize this is an obligation binding on me. And that's belief in Islam. Now there are many Muslims that don't pray anyway, which is another matter. And again, it's like anybody who doesn't follow their tradition. They still might believe in it. They're just not practicing it. Now the prayer, there are five prayers in a day. And I, this is based on an equatorial day, all right? Here's sunset. And here's sundown. Here's your meridian point. Here's your midnight point. So this is day, this is night. Now, the first prayer begins at dawn for people normally. If you ask, you know, what's the first prayer? Most people will say dawn prayer. In reality, the first prayer according to the Muslims is the sunset prayer. This is also people who know the Jewish tradition are familiar with the fact that the day begins at sunset. Right? This is the same in the, in the Islamic tradition. The day begins at sunset because it's based on a lunar month. The month begins at the sighting of the lunar moon for the Muslims. And the lunar month begins with sunset. That's the first time that the moon is visible when it's new. Now, this this prayer last it's got a short window until the red is gone out of the sky that's the time for maghrib so muslims are supposed to pray it very quickly now it's interesting that the quran says in many places that the two ends of the day are the times when people should remember god particularly <coughs> these two ends the dawn and the sunset and I think something that many people notice and the Muslims take it as you know this is uh, one of these aspects uh, that they take from the Quran of everything being in praise that oftentimes animals gather at those periods you'll see birds gather at, at sunset and they'll gather at the early part before the sunrise and chirp away they literally gather and congregate during that time and chirp away the crickets in the evening start the, the frogs. That these are all seen as literally praises. That's the way the Muslims view it. Now I'm sure, you know, an evolutionary uh, biologist would say, <laughs> the cricket's cooling himself off. Um, <laughs> you know, and, but it's interesting. I mean, why uh, things in creation do these things, gather and do these things. The Muslims view it as really acts of praise. The next prayer goes from when the, the red is gone and this is called Maghrib prayer or, or the sunset prayer. The next prayer is when the sun, all the red is gone. And this goes basically until midnight, one should do it. And really for the first third of the night, if you divide the night into uh, three parts between 6 a.m. and 6 p.m., it should be done in that first third of the night after the redness is gone. That's the best time. And then after that, you're delaying it and the prayers are not encouraged to be delayed. And it's prohibited to delay them until they actually go out of the time altogether. So that is the next prayer. And then this period is all encouraged for people who want to do extra prayers. The night time in particular is encouraged. Many Muslims uh, do night prayers. Many do not. But there are many Muslims that do do night prayers some portion of the night. I mean, my teacher, uh, I think minimum was maybe three hours. That was his practice to stand in prayer. Um, 
and uh, you know the the man who's here that's his practice because I've lived with him for uh, over a year in different places and, and that's his practice so uh, many Muslims will make it a practice to pray at night it's a good time it's a time of meditation it's a time of tranquility and stillness and also there's a there's a nice Hasidic tale uh, of why the prayer is a special time um, in, in, in this Hasidic tale I think Bubert talks about it that um, that the seeker of God is like a thief trying to steal something precious and the thief always works at night the the next prayer is dawn prayer and that begins at the first light now there's an interesting phenomenon called the false dawn which is a white light that will show up towards the middle uh, of the eastern horizon and then it disappears and then after that the second dawn comes up the second dawn is the dawn that the Muslims are begin their uh, prayer and that will go until right before sunset all of that is time that you can pray the preferred time is at the first time but any time before that you can pray so technically we could pray anyway from 4.30 till about is it time to break? okay sunrise yeah sunrise until the sun rises um, so we could technically here pray anytime from 4.30 to about probably quarter to six or 5.30 whenever the sun rises it would be perfectly acceptable unless if you if you overslept there's nothing there's no responsibility the Prophet Muhammad peace be upon him said the sleeper has no responsibility the madman has no responsibility and the child has no responsibility until they uh, reach puberty so the sleeper has no responsibility but there, there is an idea that if you went to sleep not intending to get up for, for the prayer then you are responsible that you, that you should intend to get up for the prayer that if you just say you know I, I set your alarm for eight then that, that would be considered something wrong that you've done something wrong and then the sun comes up now you will notice a phenomenon because all of the prayers are based on the sun this the night prayer when this all the red is gone from the sun the dawn prayer when the first light of the sun comes and then the next prayer what you'll notice as the sun is moving up in the sky and I think this will be a really interesting exercise uh, to give to some of your students if, if you're interested in doing this because it will teach them some very interesting things one of the interesting and fascinating things about human beings is that uh, astronomy is really where we get our mathematics from early man became very fascinated with the sky and began to examine and watch the sky and watch the movements of the stars and began to discern certain patterns right and over centuries an accumulation of knowledge occurs right I mean this is what um, uh, Richard Feynman mentioned that uh, the people who are familiar with him six easy pieces and uh, he, he was a Nobel Prize winning physicist from uh, Cal Poly and got his Nobel Prize in quantum electrodynamics whatever that means but uh, he, he said that, uh, for the, that the physicists and, I, and the astronomers, it's true, and others, he said really what we're like is, is you know, people that are watching the gods on Mount Olympus play chess. And they don't let you in on the rules. So what you do is, you know, you have, what, 40, 50 years of thinking in your lifetime. You start watching the game and you notice, oh, the bishop only moves that way. And, the pawn moves this way and the queen moves this way and you start discerning rules and he said and we begin to write those down right so we're discerning that there's patterns here but we really haven't been given a whole lot of information and one of the things he says is that the problem with this is that every once in a while something like castling comes up and, and you, know, <laughs> you, you have to start all over again what was that you know so what happened is people became for some reason obsessed with the meridian point determining when the sun reached that meridian point now in the Quran it says that we gave you the sun and the stars one of the reasons the sun according to the Quran was given to human beings was to allow you to measure your years and learn mathematics I mean that's literally in the Quran that one of the wisdoms behind that is to learn mathematics now, just, I mean, this is like, 
they'll probably get maybe a little upset if you start bringing geometry into a world history class or something like that, right? But the idea here is that what, what, what will happen, how the prayer is determined, is you put a stick here or you use your body. And if anybody's interested in learning this, I can teach them. All right, because I really, this is fascinating. I've done this with children at Muslim camps. They're fascinated by it. They really, they really enjoy it. And it's a lot of fun. Um, what, what you'll notice is towards the western horizon, a shadow shows up that's very long from the early sun. And this shadow will continue to decrease as the sun's moving up until it reaches its shortest point here. And this is the 90 degree angle if, if you're looking at the 180 circumference, right? Zero to 180. The 90 degree angle. Now, if you're in an equatorial uh, place on the earth, which is a very small narrow place where the sun will actually be directly overhead twice a year like Mecca, the shadow will disappear completely. The sun is literally directly over your head and the shadow disappears. For us, uh, you'll notice in the winter the shadow's long, in the summer it's short. Based on the movement in the winter towards the south of the sun, shifting the earth. I mean, I, I prefer to look at it geocentrically just because that's ex phenomenologically or experientially. We experience it geocentrically. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to speak in geocentric terms, all right? So I'm not trying to, you know, uh, get out of uh, abstract thinking, but I'm just trying to look at this as a, we experience it as human beings. That instead of looking as the shift of the, the earth, I'd rather look at it as the sun is moving over. Because that's how we see it, and that's how young people experience it. The, when the sun moves over to the south, uh, then the shadow becomes longer in the winter. Now as the sun's moving back towards the north, then the shadow is getting smaller and smaller. So you can actually see the movement of the shadow during the year. It's a very interesting thing, and I've, I've been doing it for a while. So I'm very now accustomed to knowing, I mean, I can pretty much work out what time of the day it is just on my shadow if the sun's out. Because I know the shadow pretty well in the winter and the summer. And if you live with Bedouin who know the sun really well, it's phenomenal how accurate they can tell you the time based on just looking at the shadow. Now there's an interesting verse in the Quran that I find really fascinating because when I first read this and I first began uh, examining shadows, uh, I, you know, I started thinking about and wanted to look in the Quran. There's a verse that said, Adam tara ila rabbika kayfa madda dhul. Haven't you looked at your Lord how your Lord moves the shadow? Now this gets back to a Tawhidi idea or an idea that the sun is a means, but in reality it is God that is creating this phenomenon for us. And then it says, Walau sha'a rabbuka raja'aluhu sakina. And had your Lord wanted, he would have made the shadow stationary. Right? So we could. Imagine a world in which the sun is directly overhead, it would be pretty hot to live in, but the shadow wouldn't really move, right? It would be stationary. But we do experience a movement of the shadow. And then it says, And we made the sun as a, as a, a prover or an indicator of shadow. Now the interesting thing in Arabic, the word for shade and shadow, which are related in, in English, are from the same, uh, they're the same word, identical word. When I first read that verse, I was really struck, you know, what does that mean we made this, the sun an indicator of, of, of shade or the shadow? So I went to a commentary by Fakhruddin al-Razi, who's a uh, ninth, ninth century Persian commentary of the Quran, and he just gave this really interesting uh, explanation of that, saying that what the Quran here is doing is it's indicating that, that one of the greatest blessings of God that most human beings are completely unaware of is shade. Now this is obviously more obvious in, in a hot country. I admit that. But if you start thinking about it, it actually gets quite profound. Because what he said is what shade is, is a mixture of light and darkness. And the only reason we can see is because of this admixture of light and darkness. If we were in pure light, we could not see. And if we were in pure darkness, we could not see. So shade, in fact, is everywhere. And it's happening all the time. Right now, there's a mixture of light and darkness in this room, which is enabling us to see. And what the Quran is saying, had it not been for the sun, you wouldn't even thought about the shade. It's not something that you would give given a whole lot of thought to. 
So there's an idea of learning about the shade and seeing as, as literally a proof of, of the existence of God. That's how Razi uses it. And the other thing about shade which is interesting is that the, the paradise is described as shade spread out. It's just shade spread out. So what will happen is in a northerly climate in the summer, the shadow will reach its shortest point. And what you can do is get the students like to put a stick up with a, with a piece of paper and they can measure it with a ruler. So they can watch the shadow uh, going closer and closer until it reaches the shortest point and then they'll see it start increasing again. The, the, at the point when it reaches the shortest point, that is the meridian point. So they can actually learn to determine for themselves the meridian point, which is the 90 degree angle. Now, at the point which the sun moves one uh, la, uh, one uh, altitudinal degree away from the center of the earth, uh, from the center of the sky, which is here. That is the beginning of the Dhuhr prayer. And the sign of it is the shadow begins to increase towards the east. Now that is the first prayer that was given to the Prophet Muhammad. And the idea there is according to the commentators, is the interesting thing about the, the, the beginning of the... See, what's happening is the sun is rising, it reaches the midpoint of the sky, and then it begins its decline. And the idea is, is that that is an indication for the human being. That just as we are like the sun, we rise up, we reach our full uh, strength and power, and then we begin to decline. And sunset is cosmologically seen as death. The idea that death is imminent, that death is coming. And so the shade itself is seen as an indication of our own lives. That just as, as, uh, as, it, as we rise in, in, in the east, we will also set in the west. And so the, the day itself has been traditionally by the Muslims des described cosmologically. They say that the, the mid-morning is like spring. It's like the child coming into existence. And spring is a fun time. It's a, it's a time, you know, generally where there's, the, the, you know, it's, it's a time of renewal. And, and it's a time of innocence, right? And traditionally, you know, there's a lot of just folkloric uh, things about people falling in love in spring and doing these things because it's an innocent time. That's how we associate it folklorically. And then summer is seen as uh, when youth, coming into youth, Right? And it's, it's a time of work. It's a time of harvest. Youth is when you have a lot of energy to, to begin to harvest your crops. So it's a time of study. It's a time of dedication. It's a time of exerting a lot of effort. And then the fall is seen as the moving now into maturity. And this is the time when you benefit from the fruits of your youth that you harvested that your mind begins to mature in a way that you, you, you now become uh, conscious and you begin to use the wisdom of your youth uh, in ways. And this is interesting, I think Erickson's model is, is, is interesting, that he talks about um, uh, this period being productivity versus stagnation, right? That people begin to think beyond themselves as they reach into this mature period of around 40. And it's interestingly that the Muslim worldview does def to mark the year 40 as this year where, where perception begins to change, where one begins to get outside of one's egotistical youth and begins to really look beyond uh, one's personal uh, welfare and benefit and really looks, how can my life be meaningful? And ultimately meaning in life arises out of service, out of going beyond the self, out of looking at what is, what is my contribution going to be to my society? to my family, to my culture, to my tradition. And this is this period of the fall. And it's a beautiful period because it's a maturing and it's when there's variation in color, right? You're getting uh, the, the changing of leaves and all these things. It's a very interesting time fall. And then uh, winter, which is uh, moving into that last period of life. The dryness, the, the, the leaves fall, right? The body begins to where and, and, and we enter into that last period of our lives and then death and then according to the Muslims rebirth in the next world right which would be the renewal and spring is the sign of that so you can see how in the prayer 
there is this uh, cosmology embedded here. Um, I think we'll take a break now, all right? Is, is that good? And then what we'll do is we'll come back and I'll open it up for some questions about the first section and then uh, start on the second section, okay?